expecting temperatures in the mid to low 80s today. That's where we were on Thursday and Wednesday weekend. afternoon guys today we're going to talk about some parallel racks I'm JR Mayo I've been working in the supermarket refrigeration industry for roughly 27 years and I kind of want to start breaking down these racks and I've got a series of videos I want to make that we can do this with but the first thing we're going to talk about is why do we call it a parallel rack well when we're looking at these racks you can see we have a lot of piping coming in these are numbered circuits, and the circuits are identified downstairs through the cases. We have several coming into this one common suction line, and they all come over and tie to our three compressors. And these compressors tie in there. They're all parallel with each other. So depending on load calculations and how much refrigerant you're using and stuff, how much horsepower you're going to need will depend on how many compressors you're going to have in this parallel system. So that's why we call it a parallel rack. Everything is in line with each other. Same thing with the liquid going down to the cases. We have a common liquid header going down. It's all in parallel with each other. How do we control temperature in the cases? Because you're gonna have a rack that's gonna have a frozen case that only needs to be about zero degrees. And then you're gonna have another case that has ice cream in it. And a lot of customers like to keep their ice cream around negative eight, negative 10 degrees. So you don't want your frozen peas to be negative eight, negative 10, because that's just a waste of energy, but you do your ice cream. So we control that through our suction pressure. And anybody that's doing refrigeration or in the field, even HVAC, knows that your pressure and your temperature correlate. If you have a higher pressure, you're gonna have a higher temperature. Uh, so keep that in mind when we're talking about this. So the first step is, I'll show you, is we have what we call an E2. This gets a simple computer screen that gives all the information that we want. And if we come to circuits, you'll see different set points for this. We have one that's negative eight and one that's negative five set point. Well, we want to control that through our suction pressure. And as these circuits are showing, we have what we call an electronic evaporator pressure regulator. You have EPRs, which are just evaporator pressure regulators that run off mechanical settings, but these are electric. This computer will actually drive this valve. We, uh, short term, you know, in the field, we'll call them CDS valves. Borland makes these. They call them CDS, so we need two. But it's really an electronic evaporator pressure regulator, EEPR is what you like to say. So this computer will say, our case is running negative eight degrees, and I want that EEPR valve only to be open 7%. That valve will open and close as that temperature tries to meet set point. So if the case goes in defrost, it's gonna warm up, of course, and then when it comes out of defrost, that EEPR valve will go to 100% until it can reach its set point. That's how this EPR is controlling that temperature. Now, what we can do also is we can go under our suction setup and we see that we have a 12 pound set point and we're running about nine pounds suction. That's pretty low, isn't it? That's what we need for this R449A rack to maintain the temperatures. You have a pressure temperature chart, you find your R449A and you say, hey, what temperature do I need to maintain? And then you convert that temperature to pressure and then you subtract 10 and that's how you get that set point for those. So keep that in mind where you're doing it. So that's the basic operation of how the CDS valves will operate. Now we'll just go through real fast how the refrigeration flows through this rack. If we start with the compressors, our compressors are gonna pull in suction pressure that's coming from our main header, parallel rack, pull it in and we're gonna discharge it. Now we all tie our discharge lines together and we have a common discharge header. That common discharge header is gonna flow through the back of this rack it's going to go into our oil separator. You want to be able to remove the oil that that compressor 
is pushing out and keep it back into the system. So we do that with an oil separator. That's what that is. We'll go into that another day, how that oil separator works. But basically, discharge gas goes into our oil separator, leaves our oil separator, and goes out to our condensers. And of course, if you're in the trade, you know what a condenser does. It condenses the vapor refrigerant into a liquid refrigerant. We have a split valve. The split valve is for low ambient conditions If the because in refrigeration, we still need refrigeration in the winter. So we got to run it 24 seven. Well, when it gets really cold outside, we have to control how much head pressure we got coming off the condenser. And we do that with a split valve. We'll get that into another day. But anyway, goes through your condenser, comes out. Hopefully if everything's right, we're coming out of liquid. And we enter our receiver. Now you'll notice another valve up there on your left, that's called a heat reclaim valve. That's another part that we do, it's free heat. I'll talk about how we use that in another episode. So basically we're coming out of the condenser, it's going into our liquid receiver. You can tell how much liquid we kind of have in this receiver by the gauge. And that you'll see we have about 40% liquid coming in. So we have 40% liquid, which should have plenty of liquid for the system. We come out of the liquid, we go into a dryer. We want to make sure it stays nice and clean. So we have what we call liquid line dryers, filters. Uh, it's not just a filter, it is a dryer. So you can say filter dryer or dryers. Everybody pretty much knows what they're talking about. Once you leave the liquid line dryers, you clean it up. Now you're going into your common liquid line header. Of course, we have the side glass. And then it pushes all that liquid and you have several different circuits going down that feeds liquid to our cases. Once it's downstairs in the case, it goes through an electronic expansion valve or it'll go through a mechanical expansion valve, some sort of metering device has to go through, gets in the evaporator, all that liquid turns into a vapor if everything's running right. As it comes back up, it'll come up through your circuit suction, your CDS valve or your EEPR, electronic evaporator pressure regulator that control temp for us, goes back into our suction header and all the way back down into your compressors and it cycles back through. Now, that's all it does, it cycles. It just changes state back and forth, hot to cold, hot to cold. And that's the basic operation of our parallel rack. This particular parallel rack also has what we call a hot gas defrost. We're sending discharged gas that's coming off our compressors and we're gonna sit it down in the case to de-ice it. And uh, with that, we wanna use our hot gas valve and you can see how it ties into the suction line. We do send discharge hot gas into the case. It flows through the case, warms that case up, melts ice that is formed by the coil, and then drains out into a floor drain. We'll start with the circuit when the controller is calling for something to go and defrost. So if we come here to our main screen and we go to circuits, we're going to find, we'll start with the very first one, circuit 119. We're going to hit enter. And you can see we have a hot gas defrost and the refrigeration state and what everything's doing. So if we want to put this in defrost and test it, we can do it real quick. We're going to log in. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into this and you can see where it says manual defrost. Enter and we're going to say bypass command. How you want to do it? Well, let's do a lookup. We want a defrost. You have emergency defrost and defrost. Emergency defrost and defrost are kind of the same except the defrost is going to go through a series of, hey, if I get to the case to the temperature I want, I'm going to terminate before I get to my time to end. The emergency defrost says, I don't care about the termination that you've got programmed. I'm going to go the full length of defrost that you have programmed in the system. So we're going to just select defrost. Enter. Defrost, enter again. Now it's in a pump down mode. That EEPR is at 100. It'll go down to zero here in a second and start shutting that off. But as you can see in our setup, how this thing is, is asking for, it says I, you can go through defrost for 24 minutes and that's it. And then we have a 13 minute runoff. So after it's defrost, it's gonna sit for 13 minutes just to let all that liquid, all that liquid water drain out of the case so we don't ice up a drain pan or anything. That's what that is. Now you see our state is defrost. Our EEPR valve is closing off. We're going to give it a little bit of time to close off. And then you will see this go active. Because right now we are inactive. It'll go active. And that'll tell us that we're in defrost. On this board here, this 
is our what we call our uh, master gas valve. And all it does is when it energizes, it's going to energize a defrost differential regulator for us to allow us to get a differential on our defrost. When that happens, I'll, I'll kind of explain to you a little bit better how it goes. All right, now our case has gone into defrost, and we can see that our hot gas defrost is active on our screen. Might be a little hard to see. So there's two things that are going to happen with this hot gas defrost. The first thing that's going to happen is we will energize our hot gas solenoid. This hot gas solenoid is tied to our discharge line coming off the compressors. So when this energizes, discharge gas is going to down the case. It's going to want to come this way, but this is closed off. We're at zero percent. That way it can't come back up in here. That's going to force all that hot gas down into the case. And when it gets down to the case, it's going to want to come back up. It can't go through the expansion valve. So there's a check valve that goes around the expansion valve, ties into the liquid line. And then it pushes this liquid back up into the case. Now, you're probably wondering, how am I getting 200 pounds discharge gas to overcome 200 pounds of liquid pressure? Because the pressure is the same. That's where a defrost differential regulator comes in. You remember me mentioning the master gas solenoid on there? Well, if you come here, you'll see it's energized now. This light is on. So with that light on, our DDR, defrost differential regulator, should be energized. I'll show you where that's at. And it does exactly what it says it does. It's a defrost differential. So that's going to hold pressure back on our discharge gas to increase it. We like to see 15, maybe 20 pounds. I like 15 pounds on low temp differential because we don't want to get too much heat. So what happens basically is now I have 15 pounds higher pressure on that side going down into my case than I do my liquid because as you follow the lines, it's going into our condensers. So our condenser now has 200 pounds and our discharge line going down to our cases has 215 pounds. That's able to push that liquid back up into our circuit to get ice because you got to have a continuous flow through that coil to get it de-ice pretty quickly. That's how the DDR and the hot gas valve work in with each other. Uh, those DDRs do come out of sync sometimes and you have to adjust them and there's a I have another video that how to set a DDR that you're welcome to go find and look and it goes through how you're supposed to set that DDR. Our temperature is rising on the case. The fans are probably off because we do shut the fans off on this particular case for hot gas defrost. As that case warms up there is a sensor on the case coil that tells the computer hey I'm warm enough you can terminate defrost and that's why you see termination. The state is in drip. That means the CDS valve EEPR is 100% closed, the defrost valve is, is um, off, and the DDR, defrost differential regulator, isn't regulating pressure anymore. So everything's off, it's going to sit here for 13 minutes. And after 13 minutes, it'll come back on and go into refrigeration state. We're back in refrigeration mode. As you can see, our valve is going to open 100%, and it's going to stay at 100% until our temperature gets back down to set point. Guys, that's it on our defrost differential regulator and our hot gas defrost systems. So I um, hope you enjoyed that segment of it, and we'll continue with some other uh, important equipment stuff, like our split valves control for ambient. Thank you.